Now, representatives of governments, industry, academia and think tanks have gathered in Singapore for a Defence Technology Summit. They're networking and collaborating on the development of defence and security capabilities. One focus is on how digital and dual-use technologies have reshaped the nature of combat. A key speaker is U.S. General Paul Nakasone, the head of the United States Cyber Command and Director of National Security Agency. He took part in a fireside chat to discuss what's working in his space and where things need to improve. We have to continue to, to be very, very aggressive in terms of being able to drive the bar higher. Uh, I, I think that we have a good start here. We have a, a great start in terms of, you know, what countries here and, and what we've been able to work with ASEAN nations to be able to share and to, and to talk about the future. But individually, I think all countries have to think much differently about how do they secure their data, how do they secure their networks, and how do they secure their weapon systems. These are, these are things that, you know, traditionally, I think we've given short shrift to. Well, before General Nakasone's fireside chat, he sat down for a broadcast exclusive interview with CNA Steve Fly. And Steve started by asking him how the rapid rise of artificial intelligence changed the game for cybersecurity, both as a threat, but also as a tool to counter that threat. This topic for the summit is digital and, and dual use technology. And if you think about it in three ways, first of all, being able to recognize it. Secondly, being able to adapt quickly to it. And then finally, how do you employ it? This is a, a technology that provides great opportunity and also great challenge though. And if you could just elaborate a bit perhaps on some of the, the threats that you see with AI and how you look to counter them. Certainly, as we take a look at the rise of influence operations, not just in you know scale, but also sophistication, uh, we think about how AI, AI might be used to, to develop a narrative uh, and how AI might be used to influence a particular leaning on a, on a policy or, or an election. The way that we employ our operations is to be able to, first of all, identify it and then shine a light on it, being able to identify what an adversary is doing and the narrative they're trying to espouse. And do you see sort of the dissemination of misinformation as being a key component of that? It is. Our understanding of cyber threats goes back to 2018 where we began with the Russia small group bringing together both the United States Cyber Command and NSA to deal primarily with the Russian threat. What do we see in 2018? We saw a series of actors operating outside the United States trying to influence us with bots and other messages. What did we learn? First of all, that you have to do three things. First of all, you have to understand the threat. Secondly, sharing information. And third, taking action. This has been the secret, our template for success in 2018, 2020, and 2022. And as we've seen with the U.S. and the China relationship, uh, trade is now sort of closely intertwined with national security issues, geopolitical risk, and, and the like. Help us understand how that gets complicated by dual-use uh, technology that you mentioned earlier, and even social media apps like TikTok. We saw just you know recently, uh, TikTok CEO was grilled in a congressional hearing. Let's make sure that uh, we set foundation of what the United States looks for here in the Indo-Pacific region. We look for a free, open, and prosperous uh, region. And so as we take a look at you know, a dual-use technology, as you indicated, like artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, what we're concerned about is how could it be used uh, in a manner that is uh, detrimental to uh, the ideas of free speech or the ideas of being able to, to build partnerships by like-minded nations. This is something that, that we uh, remain concerned about. And do you have any, any thoughts you could share about uh, social media apps like TikTok? Certainly what we're concerned about uh, at our agency and our command is the fact that it's not just a concern about the data and who controls the data, it's also who controls the algorithm. What's, what's the messages that are going to be sent to you or perhaps not sent to you? And the final piece is we're concerned about the ability for a foreign nation to have rapid access to millions of phones uh, that are you know, utilizing this, uh, this social application. I want to get your perspectives on cyber warfare uh, that's going on in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, but just to bring it back to Asia and talk about, you know, that war has really sort of put the spotlight uh, here in Asia of the status of Taiwan when it comes to China, uh, which has stated a desire for unification by force if necessary. That invasion won't just be physical. How would that play out, do you see, on, on the cyber front? And how would you, the US and its allies, uh, combat against it? Well, well, let me focus on, on the actual here and now, which is Russia, Ukraine. What have we seen and, and, and what is so important? Let me leave hypotheticals to someone else. But as we take a look at Russia, Ukraine, what have we learned? First of all, we've learned that 
Uh, it's much more difficult, difficult to conduct these type of attacks than was thought. Secondly, let's give full credit to Ukraine in terms of what they've done over the past four years. Really, they have built a level of cybersecurity that is truly uh, impactful. Uh, I accept that it's difficult to speak about hypothetical uh, future scenarios, uh, but as Secretary of State Blinken said a few days ago that, you know, China is looking at the war in Russia and UK, Ukraine and making calculations of its own about its own ambitions. Uh, do you, how big a threat do you see China on the cyber uh, security issues? So as with any adversary, we take all our adversaries seriously. There is a, a vigilance that we, uh, we apply to it. Uh, I I think the, the piece here that, that is, is so important is that, uh, that we recognize the threat and that we obviously take measures to, to deal with that threat. I think Russia-Ukraine is a, a very good example as we think about the future. Uh, what do we learn from Russia-Ukraine within the, in the non-kinetic non space of cyber? First of all, that these are very difficult operations to actually plan for and most importantly conduct. Secondly, that preparation matters. Uh, the preparation, what Ukraine did in terms of being able to raise the level of cybersecurity is incredibly important. And then the third thing, it's really about having a series of partners. Whether or not they're partners within your government, foreign partners, private sector partners, uh, these are the type of operations that, uh, that are most, uh, most effective against uh, the work that's done by an adversary in cyberspace. So a lot of lessons have been learned then from what's been happening in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, could you talk about some of the work that's been done with your allies in the region then? from the learning experience and what sort of things you're putting in place? The learning experience really begins with the sharing of intelligence uh, and being able to, to share that intelligence with our close partners and that's something we do every single day. We're obviously very concerned about a range of different uh, uh, different possibilities, everything from ransomware, their ability for ransomware to, to impact our economy and our, and our daily life to uh, an ability for an adversary to get into our critical infrastructure and, uh, and uh, be able to control that to uh, I think the last part, being able to conduct influence operations against perhaps our, our most significant thing, which is our elections. Those are the three different areas that, that really make us uh, uh, obviously very vigilant going into the future. Now, China and North Korea, another country, for example, have been accused of regular attempts and activities in this regard when it comes to cyber espionage or cyber warfare. Uh, what does it involve and how does the U.S. look to counter that? Well, the way that we address uh, these operations in the Department of Defense is through a strategy called Defend Forward. How do we at U.S. Cyber Command, operating outside the United States, persistently engage with our adversaries? How do we both enable our partners and act against these adversaries? An example of this is Hunt Forward operations. We've conducted Hunt Forward operations at the request of foreign governments to bring in 8 to 10 personnel to actually work with that partner to hunt on their networks, find adversaries' malware, find their tradecraft, and then expose it. This has been done in 22 countries on 70 different networks over the past several years. And one of the biggest concerns as an individual uh, when it comes to cybersecurity is the privacy intelligence debate. How do you manage that? And I understand Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Services Act, or FISA, permits the U.S. government to conduct targeted surveillance of, of foreign persons located outside the U.S. It's set to expire at the end of this year. What would be uh, your argument for it to be maintained? We have a very, very set and defined series of responsibilities that are governed uh, by our Constitution and our laws. Second is the fact that we're able to utilize this based upon a trust and confidence of the American people. That trust and confidence is enabled by a series of different overseers. This is a multi-level operation. And the final piece is, uh, my message is, is that we have a culture of compliance, being able to follow the rules at the National Security Agency. This is impactful. This is one of the things that I think really warrants the, the uh, reauthorization of this act.